It's definitely a fish. I don't think so. There's no way that's a fish. Look at the size of it. Well, it's a big fish. It's a shark. That's not a shark. Look at the fin on top. Now, where are its teeth? Well, it lost its teeth. It's old. It's a fossil, yeah, but it's, it's definitely not a fossilized shark. Right. It's, They're not that old. It's a, it's a shark. What's it? You don't even know the name of it, do you? Yeah, it's a Dunkleosteus. It's a Dunkleosteus, I think. Okay, so you may be right. Maybe it is a fish after all, but you have to admit it's a fish that's bigger than most sharks. Well, yes. Yeah. Now, everything okay. we've learned about life that's been around before us, we learned from the fossil record. And as paleontologists and geologists are making new discoveries, we learn new things. Hmm, the fossil record kind of maintains a story of the past, it sounds like. Sure, yeah. So if somebody or something wanted to become part of the fossil record, how might he accomplish that? Well, it's, it's not that easy. The, the thing has to meet two criteria. First, it has to, at least at some point in time, have been living. Done. Check. Go on. Okay, second, it, it has to be at least 10,000 years old. I feel good. I think I can get there. Okay, let me clarify here. It's actually very rare for something to become a fossil. So many things have to go right in order to preserve that organism's bones and skeletal system. Out of all the species that have ever existed on Earth, less than 1% have turned into a fossil. So you'd have to be pretty special to be a fossil. Okay, so I know it's hard, but it sounds like it'd be worth it. So what would somebody or something do to make sure they gave themselves a good chance of becoming a fossil? We can break down the fossilization process into four main methods. The first two processes both involve groundwater filled with minerals. After an organism is buried and all the soft parts like the skin and the muscle have decomposed, only the hard parts are left. This includes bones, teeth, antlers, horns, and claws. Even though these are the hard parts, they aren't completely solid. There are tiny holes in these hard pieces. When the organism is living, these holes are filled with air, but after the organism dies, gets buried, and is exposed to groundwater, over time, those pores get filled with minerals, and the skeleton turns into fossils. In replacement fossilization, as the groundwater flows over the remains for huge stretches of time, the minerals dissolved in the water replace all of the original hard parts. In our experiment, the salt dissolved in the water soaks into the bone-shaped sponge. As the water evaporates, only the salt is left. The exact shape of the bone is kept, but all the original organic material is replaced by minerals. In the process of permineralization, a very similar thing is happening with the groundwater and the minerals. However, instead of the original material being replaced, only those open, porous spaces are filled in with minerals. So the original remains are still present, but they become partially mineralized. Place a piece of celery in colored water. The colored water models minerals in the groundwater that fill porous material when it's buried, just like permineralization in nature. A third type of fossilization is called carbonization. Most living things contain hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon. After an organism is buried in the sediment, it can be compressed or squashed by heavy layers for millions of years. Its hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen components are forced out, leaving a thin film of carbon showing the form and impression of the original organism. Think of this as a carbon copy of the original plant. All that's left of the original plant is the thin layer of carbon. This is often found within fern fossils. It can occur in animals too, but it's very rare. The final process we're going to look at is called mold and cast fossilization. Very often, fossils are not the actual parts of the plant or animal, but a print or an impression that has been left behind. This is called a mold. For molded fossils to be found, the impression must be left in the mud that quickly hardens and is uncovered by another layer of mud. Footprints, leaf prints, shell prints, and even feather and wing prints can be found as fossil molds. If the mold is filled with sediment and minerals that harden to become stone, a cast is formed. A cast is a stone replica of the plant or animal that died. Here inside this rock, we can find the cast of a trilobite and the mold in which it formed. 
and we can easily make our own mold and cast fossil with a little bit of model magic, a shell, and some plaster of Paris. By pressing your organism into the model magic, you make your mold. Pull out the original organism, fill it with the plaster of Paris that would represent the minerals, let it dry overnight, and the next day you will have a cast of your organism. Replacement, permineralization, carbonization, molds and casts. All sound like good options to me. They are. And thanks to these four processes, we've learned so much about what's happened on Earth in its 4.6 billion year history. 4.6 billion years, that's a really long time. And I'll tell you, I can't wait till I get to see my fossils on display in a museum someday. Sure. But if that's not your thing, you could always visit the Indiana State Museum and look at our collection of fossils and learn about what Indiana was like when it was covered in miles of glacial ice during the Ice Age. Or what it was like when it was covered by a shallow, warm sea, like when that fish we saw earlier was swimming around in Indiana. Did you say fish? Yeah, fine. It was a fish. You're I right. I told you it was a fish. Okay, it was a fish. You're right. But what about that thing with the big...